don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell. Hey, hey, welcome back. If you were with us for questions one through eight, thanks for coming back. If you weren't, that's all right. You aced one through eight anyways. Here are questions nine through 16 for the January 2023 Algebra 2 exam. Uh, these are multiple choice questions. Booyah! There are a total of 24. Uh, there are two credits each, two points each. No partial credit. You don't got to show any work. You just got to record which, which option is your answer. So let's go ahead and do just that. Number nine, what is the solution set for the equation x plus 2 over x plus x over 3 equals 2x squared plus 6 over 3x? I am going to use the calculator. Why wouldn't you? I have no idea. I'm going to put this left side into y1, okay? And I am now going to put this right side into y2. And I like to color coordinate, kids, because y1 is blue and y2 is red. And my uh, TI-84 plus C, S-E-C, the C stands for color, but you know what the C also stands for? I don't care because I'm just going to put it in the calculator. Let's go. So I'm going to turn this bad boy on. We still have some work from the previous section there, but again, let's just clear all this out. Oh, good times, that problem, good times. So for Y1, I'm gonna put that entire left side with that blue curly brace underneath it. I'm gonna create my fraction, and I'm gonna put X plus two over X. Make sure you're doing this correct. Okay, plus alpha Y equals enter x over 3. The first time I did this problem, uh, for the first fraction, x plus 2 over x, I put a 2 on the bottom in the denominator instead of an x. And it came out wrong. I was trying to figure out what I did, and I just, I just pressed the wrong button. Okay, the red function, y2, is going to be the right side. Again, we'll need a fraction. 2x squared plus 6 over 3x. Everything looks good, and I'm going to graph this bad boy, this puppy. Okay, here is the blue side. There you go. Major dip. And here comes the red side. Choo-choo. Oh, okay. There is one clear intersection here. Um, it looks like, to me, right here is the only intersection. Maybe that's at three. I don't know, I could look at my table, but why not just go to second trace and pick intersect, and that will give you the exact intersection point. Now, I don't see my little spider dude. I miss him, okay? If I look at the bottom left, this is the location of my spider dude. He's where X is zero. So he's, if I move to the right, notice that bottom left part where X, is cir uh, X equals zero is circled. When I move to the right, see how it moves? And there's my spider dude. It's giving me the X location. So I'm close enough. You don't have to be right on it, okay? And all you got to do is hit enter three times. One, two, three. And if you look at the bottom left now, it gives me the answer. They intersect where X is three. That's the only choice. Put this right here, and that's choice three. Well, what about zero? Okay. First of all, if I look, no graph hits x is 0. There's an asymptote there. It means that no graphs touch there. How come? If I were to pick 0, what happens if I put a 0 in for x? Then I have a 0 in the denominator. If I were to solve this algebraically, 0 would be an extraneous solution, meaning we probably come up with the answer, but it does not work. You're welcome. I mean, we use the calculator for 9, let's do it again for 10. How many real solutions exist for the system of equations below? I do not want to know what the solutions are. I just want to know how many real solutions. I could do this algebraically, but why bother? I'm going to put this in Y1, and I'm going to put this in Y2, and I'm going to count the number of times these intersect because the solution is where they intersect. So 
Let's go back here. Let's go here. Clear these bad boys out. And then why one? Um, instead of one quarter, I'm going to put just 0.25. That's the same thing as one quarter. X minus 8. And instead of one half, I'm going to put 0.5 because that's the same as one half. X squared plus 2X. Let's graph this. You tell me how many. Let me get rid of this circle here. You tell me how many intersection points you see. You know how many intersection points I see? Yeah, none. Zero. <laughs> it doesn't intersect at all. At no point in this graph does the blue line and red line cross or touch zero solutions, zero real solutions. Uh, bye bye. Number 11, which equation represents a polynomial identity? You don't need to know anything about algebra. Nay, let me restate that. You are not going to have to perform any algebra. It is just knowing a rule. Notice that every single solution starts with x cubed plus y cubed. In case you forgot, children, when I factor any sum or difference of cubes, Okay, what I do is the first parenthesis with two terms is just the cubed root of each one of these. So it's x and y. Okay, then, okay, I take this first term and I square it. So that's the first term in the next parenthesis, x squared. Now, I take the first term times the second term. That's the second term here, x times y. So this is x first term times itself, first term times the second term, and last, it's the second term times itself, so y squared. The only thing I'm missing are the signs. Okay, the only thing I'm missing are the signs. Oh, kids, I always start with what they give me, plus. So I need a plus in the first parenthesis. It can't be this right here. Okay, and okay, notice I have two sets of parentheses. It, it can't be this one here. Okay, all right, first sign is always the same. The next sign is always opposite of what they gave me. So if we start with a plus, this has to be a minus. And the last one is always, it doesn't matter what you started with, it's always going to be a plus. There you go. And that choice happens to be minus plus there, choice two. Um, FYI, if you ever get in a situation where you're going to factor this, okay, and I, and I factor x cubed plus y cubed, and I end up with this thing down here. I end up with this. FYI, this quadratic is never factorable. This is simplified as much as you can get it. You can never factor that second quadratic, okay? So that's just knowing your rule for factoring a difference of perfect cubes or a sum of perfect cubes. Guys, 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 know your rules for exponents. This is simple. Okay, given that x is greater than 0. Okay, thanks. The expression x to the 1 fifth over x to the 1 half can be rewritten as, okay, I've just got to work some magic here. I'm going to get rid of that fraction, okay? And there are a couple ways you can do this, but this is the way that I am going to do it. X to the one-fifth over, this is one. These are both ones here. I mean, you don't have to write them. But at X to the one-half. I want to bring this up and get rid of the fraction. So now I've got X to the one-fifth times X. When I flip a term, I need to negate the exponent. Now there's no more fraction. Now the rules are simple. What happens with exponents when I multiply similar bases? I add the exponents. I take one fifth plus a negative one half. I mean, if you want to do this in the calculator, you can, and I will, although I don't have to. I mean, I'm kind of smart, kids. But, you know, just for people that are like, how do you get the fraction? What do you do? Alpha y equals enter. 1 over 5, 
plus I'm going to create another fraction and call it negative 1 over 2. And when I hit enter, because I used the fraction function, it will give me the answer as a fraction, negative 3 over 10. Okay, now I need to write this in radical form, but I know I have negative exponents. I don't want them anymore. This is technically still over 1, and there is still technically a 1 here. In order to make my exponent positive, I'm going to flip this back down. All right. Now, I suppose we could have subtracted. Yeah, I could have done that. Uh, it might have been less steps, but I've got 1 over x to the 3 tenths. Kids, top, down, bottom, out. What does that mean? The top is just going to slide down and stay with the x, and the bottom is what's going to pop out and become the root. Top, down, bottom, out. The 3 is down, the 10 is out. There you go. That is choice 3, and I guess we could have skipped this. By knowing your rules, I subtract. I subtract, okay, uh, exponents. I could have taken, okay, x to the 1 fifth minus 1 half. And instead of setting it up like here, that would have brought me right to this step. So I really could have only, I could have skipped one step, okay, because uh, multiplication means you add exponents, right? But when I divide, that means you subtract exponents. And that still gets us this answer here in orange, which I would still have to flip down, yada, yada. Okay, so there are more than one ways to do those types of problems. I like this problem. I hate this problem, <laughs> but I like it. Let's read it and let's, uh, let's knock it out the park, kids. Let's, let's cook a little bit, chefs. Oh, you fellow chefs that are watching. 13. A cyclist pedals a bike at a rate of 60 revolutions per minute. Woo! The height h of a pedal at time t in seconds is plotted below. I see it. It's beautiful. The graph can be modeled by the function h of t equals 5 sine of kt, where k is equal to what? Okay, a few things you should know. First of all, my amplitude is the 5. Okay, my frequency is the k. By definition, frequency, well, let me start this way. Period is 360 over frequency. Or we could say it's 2 pi over frequency. All right? Um, it depends if you're using degrees or not. It doesn't look like we're using degrees here. Okay? So I'm not going to use the 2 pi one. But I hope you know that the P and F are interchangeable. What do I mean? I mean, I could say f equals 2 pi over the frequency, uh, period. <laughs> the thing is, if I know what the period is, I can just plug that in here, and then there you go, I have it. Resist the urge to say that the period is 60 per minute. 60 pedals per minute. No. <laughs> okay, the period is the length of one cycle, okay? In this case, these are sine curves. A sine curve goes up and down. The cosine curve does this. We have this one right here, okay? So the length of one curve from where it starts to where it ends. Let's look at our graph. Starts here, goes up, comes down, and it comes back up. This is where it ends right here. So my sine curve should, ha should touch okay, the middle, the midline, which happens to be the x-axis, three times. That's one curve. And where does that happen? One. My period is one second, not 60 revolutions. It's one second. Look how easy this becomes. Two pi over one, which is just two pi. There you go. Done. Two things you got to know to do this problem really, really good, and I think you figured it out. You got to realize that this formula helps you get the period, and that you can just change your F and P. 
then just look at your graph and figure out what P is, because you should know that P is one cycle. Well, one cycle happens at a time of one. One and done. 14, these things are more common sense than uh, an algebraic mystery or calculation. 14 says, which statement about data collection is most accurate? All right, well, let's, let's use some common sense, kids, here. Because, you know, Mr. Vitska likes common sense. Number one says, a survey about parenting styles is given to every 10th student that enters the library. Now, you, and it will provide unbiased results. Well, first of all, um, you as a student, if they ask you about parenting styles, you might say to yourself, well, I, I can just think about my parents or my guardians. No, no. If I'm going to ask about parenting styles, I'm not going to ask students. I'm going to ask parents. So this, this is not accurate at all. It's not going to give you an unbiased. As a kid, you have a very different outlook about your life than your parents do, for the most part. Okay? Two, an observational study allows researchers to determine the cause of an outcome. Okay, no. An observation means all I'm going to do is very creepily sit in a chair and maybe with a pair of binoculars just stare at people. I'm not going to get involved whatsoever. Okay? But cause of an outcome. That means I'm not just watching. That means I'm going to throw something into a group of people, maybe some money. Hey, there you go, cash, let it rain. And uh, then I'm going to wait to see what happens. So when I, <laughs> an observation is not the same as getting involved. An observation is just watching. Cause and outcome is creating some sort of cause, like raining down money in a crowd and seeing what happens. So that, that's not that. Two is, two is tricky. Three. Margin of error increases as sample size increases. No. The more people that you take data on, that lessens your chance for any sort of error because you're becoming more accurate at it. This decreases. So by default, a survey collected from a random sample of students at a high school can be used to represent the opinions of the school population. Yes. True. Number four. How come? We're asking students about the school population, which is made up of ding, 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 students. There you go. Choice four. Okay, kids. If f of x equals one half x plus two, then the inverse function is, okay, in order to find inverses. Okay, people do this on the graph. I don't because it's easy to do algebraically. In order to find inverse on a graph, okay, if here's the graph, okay, your function, if it's an inverse, actually reflects over the line y equals x. So if I had something that looked like this, uh, I don't know, look like this, the inverse would be a reflection like that. Those are inverses. But I'm not going to do this graphically. Okay, so you would have to graph f of x, then you can graph... Okay, in the calculator, you can graph this in y1. Then you absolutely need to graph y equals x, okay, because that's the reflection line. Then graph this in y2 and see if it reflects. The blue one reflects and gives you this. If not, then try this one and so forth. So you, you can do it, but watch how easy this is. I'm going to call this y. So y equals one half x plus two. In order to find the inverse, I literally just change my y's into x's and my x's into y's, and then I solve for y again. So what do I mean? This will become an x, and this will become a y. Okay, any x you have becomes a y. Any y you have becomes an x. So if there are more than one x, you're going to have more than one y when you change them, okay? So the first step is done. Now I just solve for y again. I mean, this is literally two steps. Let's subtract two first from both sides. So we got x minus 2 equals 1 half y. Now, 
let's just multiply this by 2, because the 2 and 1 half cancel, and I get y equals, I got to multiply this side by 2. 2x minus 4. I flip the x and y, I saw it, that's your inverse. So my inverse is 2x minus 4. I mean, I don't know, that's, that's, it's kind of easy, kids. I mean, that's, that's how I would do it, but, you know, use the graph if it makes you feel warm and toasty. The final question for this video, sir, is number 16. Give it f of x is x to the fourth minus x cubed minus 6x squared. For what values of x will f of x be greater than zero? You can set this greater than zero and do an inequality in a number line, but I'm going to give you a shortcut, kiddos. <laughs> yeah, and it uses the graphing calculator, which is really nice. All right, what is the shortcut? Well. First of all, if you were here for problem 15, you're going to realize that this is the same thing as y. So if y equals x to the fourth minus x cubed minus 6x squared, okay? And, and this is a shortcut. This is something that we do in calculus, okay? But it is really easy to do. And I want to know, again, we're going to change this to y, where y is greater than 0. Let's graph this, okay? And since I wrote it in green, let's graph it. In the oh, you son of a gun. Let's graph it in the green one, which is my favorite color, by the way. In case, you know, you guys were just going to, you know, for Teacher Appreciation Week, just stalk me, find out where I live, stand outside my window and breathe heavy as I'm watching TV in my great room. And you're like, I got you a gift. I would probably call the police and not accept the gift, so don't do that at all. Now, I'm going to put the equation that we just wrote down. Okay is why we're going to put this in the green. It is x to the fourth minus x cubed minus 6x squared. Okay. I'm going to grab, oh, this guy, you devil. x cubed pop off that exponent minus 6x squared. I'm going to, yeah, oh, this guy, <laughs> just waiting to make a mistake. And I'm going to graph it here. <clears throat> now let's take a look what this looks like. Okay, comes down, comes up, comes down. Do, 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 do. Oh, up again. That's pretty. All right, so <clears throat> let me explain some logic that, that I hope makes sense. If I want to know where y is greater than 0, and y is, y is this thing here. So on my graph, this is the y-axis. This equals my x to the fourth minus x cubed. Is that minus? Did I put plus or minus in the calculator? Oh, kids. Oh, kids. K kids. Oh, I put a minus. We're all good. Okay. Minus 6x squared. Okay. The y value of any coordinate is this thing right here. So I want to see where any y value is greater than 0. Where are the y values positive or greater than 0? Anytime I'm above the x-axis, I have positive y's. Aren't these all positive y's? They are, children. And anytime I'm below the x-axis, aren't these y's negative? These are where my y's are negative. I want to know where y is bigger than 0. So I want to know where my graph is above the x-axis. Okay? From 2, negative 2, and it goes this way forever, to negative infinity. And from 3, and it goes this way forever, to positive infinity. My graph, which is y, is above the x-axis. Let me state this one more time in case you're a little confused. If I pick any point where I'm above the x-axis, the y-coordinate, for any of these points, the y will always be a positive value, right? Same thing here. If I pick any point or coordinates, isn't my y going to be positive? Down here, all of these dots, which I'll do in, uh, I don't know, gray, all of these dots, it doesn't matter where, that, 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 I will have a negative y. I want the positive y. So from negative 2, from negative infinity, to negative 2, or any time x is less than 
negative 2, and from 3 to positive infinity, or any time x is greater than 3. These are the two points where my graph is above the x-axis, which means these are the two intervals where my y's will be positive. So let's take a look. Uh, oh, choice two. Anytime I'm less than negative two or greater than three. There you go. Now, you could have done that algebraically. Go nuts. But why? Just look on your graph. Kids, we're done. I will see you for problems 17 through 24. Peace. Don't forget to subscribe and ring that bell.